Hello and welcome to Starting Conversations uh, brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. This session is the first in a series of conversations on the topic of journalism, media, information, and democracy. We'd like to thank the Mellon Foundation for their generous support and making this program series possible through their initiative, Democracy and the Informed Citizen. I'm Bethany Tabor. I am your new host of Starting Conversations. I have just stepped into the role. I am the newest program officer at the New Mexico Humanities Council, and I am taking over for Ken Watt. Um, on behalf of the council, I would love to thank Ken for all of his amazing work organizing and producing the program series thus far. I'm very thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to be kicking off this series uh, on journalism and democracy. Um, and very excited to introduce our facilitator uh, producing this series, Megan Kamrick. Megan is an award-winning journalist uh, and radio producer based in Albuquerque. She's the host of All Things Considered on KUNM FM in Albuquerque. She's also a former TED speaker and a current TED speaker coach. She's prepared a great program for us today with some amazing panelists. And I will let you take it from here, Megan. Thank you so much, Bethany. We decided to make this first panel about media literacy because we're awash in information these days that may or may not be coming from legitimate news sources. And we saw how social media was weaponized in the 2016 election to foster false information. Unfortunately, it's gotten even worse since then. So today we wanted to have a conversation about how to evaluate information sources because Right now, we all have the power to amplify things that might be totally accurate, or I'm sorry, might not be totally accurate, or even false through our own social media channels. So we have some great New Mexico journalists here, as well as experts on media literacy, and we'll have a list of resources as well online for viewers to access. We do want to start out with a bit of fun, though. Uh, Pamela Pereira is the uh, executive director of and media literacy educator for media, uh, media savvy citizens. And she's the mother of a middle school aged uh, kids in Taos. So she's very adept at teaching media literacy. She's the founder and director of media savvy citizens. It facilitates understanding positive participation and meaningful media interaction for New Mexico listeners. And we also have senior producer at Native America Calling, Monica Brain. She is a Cinnaboyne and Hunk Papa Lakota. She began her career in journalism with an internship at her tribal newspaper, studied filmmaking at Antioch College, and she has a master's degree in education. She worked at the Smithsonian National Museum of American and Indian, the Navy Museum and National Geographic, and we're so happy to have her here in New Mexico with Native America Calling. They are going to do a little role play for us to show us how media literacy can work. So let them take it away and we'll have a conversation. Are you ready? Yeah. Hey, Pamela, how are you? Hi, nice to hear from you, Monica. I know I haven't talked to you in forever. I have to tell you, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to send it to you. I found this video on YouTube that says, you're not gonna believe this, Phil and Melinda Gates are clones. Clones. Where I couldn't you, believe it. Where did you get this? YouTube, YouTube, it's right there on YouTube. So basically, okay, here's, I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but there was like evidence of the fact that they are like the Bill and Melinda Gates that you see um, you know, giving interviews and stuff like that, that's not the real Bill and Melinda Gates. And um, one of the things they did was uh, analyze an interview and Bill Gates, he blinked twice. That's it, the whole interview. So clones aren't, you know, like human clones, they're not as good as like the originals. And so they don't blink as much. And um, yeah, I couldn't believe it. And it's like, what is the point of that? Who, who is it on YouTube? YouTube. It was on YouTube. But, but do you know who, who put the information out? I don't know. Let me send you the video. Well, I can't find it right now. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. If, you know, someone's account or something. So, I mean, you wouldn't put something up that. I mean, was there evidence that they are clones? 
Yeah, I mean, the whole thing about blinking and stuff like that. And then they had some like other scientific experts on who um, were saying, you know, what they thought was the reality of, of why they're clones. So do you know if other humans have been cloned? Is that what these scientific supposed these experts say? Um, well, I know they've cloned that sheep, right? There was a sheep that got cloned. Um, I don't know. Maybe these are the first humans that were cloned. Well, what I've read is that human, like that human cloning hasn't really happened yet. So Google if human cloning actually worked and make sure it's a reliable source. It has to be a subject matter expert. It can't just be like some random blogger, you know? Okay, let me, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me Google this. Okay, are human clones real? Um, okay, so the first thing that's showing up is the National Institute of Health and Human Genome Research, uh, National Institute of Health Human Genome Research Project Human clones are not, have not happened. Okay. Okay, but see, this is the government. And uh, I have to tell you, I don't really believe everything the government tells me. I mean, first it's like, wear the mask, don't wear the mask, wear the masks. I'm okay, well, you know, if you were right, this is how I would expect this to happen, right? This is how it did happen. So remember last year that mayor and your in your town got caught embezzling money. Oh yeah. And then there was that lady, that Margaret lady. Margaret and she is called, so nosy. But she called so Action nosy. 7 News and they looked into it. And then people found out that he was stealing all kinds of money. And then because people can't keep secrets. Yeah. Right. So it's people true. cannot keep it's secrets. True. Margaret tells me stuff all the time about what's going on up there. I And uh, she, she kind of brought him down, to be perfectly honest, which was good because he stole a lot of money from our town. Yeah, well, people can't keep secrets. So if human, you know, we're talking about human cloning. I'm just saying that you should do a little bit more research before you take the word here. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm just saying you should watch the video that I just sent to you and maybe we can agree to disagree. How's your mom? And scene. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, I understand, Monica, that this is an actual thing that you <laughs> So this is um this is based on a conversation that someone did have with someone else um uh about uh whether or not you know they they believe they had saw a video and believed that you know humans had been cloned and that Bill and Melinda Gates were cloned. So um, Pamela, how did this represent a way to put media literacy practices into action, right, you know, with people we interact with, our friends? Right, and well, specifically, like we're talking about conspiracy theory, right? Which is at the most extreme level, there's no trust in mm -hmm. um, anything but the echo chamber that's happening and that we know happens out there, which is a small percentage of people really. But it's like, how do you handle the situation, right? You ask them like where they got their information. Is it a reliable source? But not in a confrontational way, right? Because then you're, when it's confrontational, then it alienates people. Um, Google it, make sure that you're, you know, looking, you know, know, understand where it's coming from. Um, but so I think that's, those are the, you know, those are the skills, right? Those are the things that like a media literacy person would be asking themselves if they were looking at a video about human cloning. Is it reliable? Where's it coming from? Should I look at other sources to see if this information can be verified? And Monica, you regularly have done shows on Native America Calling focused on media literacy or news literacy. What are some of the issues that you find you, know, you need to keep coming back to with your audience? And what are some new ones that have been popping up? Yeah, so um, the regular issues that we need to keep coming back to are like, how do you get reliable sources of information um, when you're sharing things online? Where how do you know that this is um, true or that this is a, 
reliable. Um, and some new things. And then so one thing we focus a lot on, um, which is in the realm of media literacy, are scams. And when like um, scams show up in people's lives, particularly for Native folks, uh, they have a lot to do with um, classic things like people will um, get emails that say that they're getting something or, or they got a scholarship or something like that. And we've heard story after story of, of these kinds of things where people are going to stores and buying gift cards to pay their warrants that they supposedly have out and and things like that. So um, the newest ones that I've heard, and this actually happened um, in Native America, an elderly woman got a call from someone who said that um, her that she was her niece and she was in the hospital with COVID. And so, you know, these are, so we, they're all in the same realm of like, where's this information coming from? Is this reliable? Who is this? That kind of th stuff. And Native Americans are not any more susceptible to these kinds of things than the rest of the public. It's just that our show is a platform for Native folks. And so we sort of look at it from, from the Native perspective, Native lens. Also joining us today is uh, Marisa DeMarco. She's a reporter in Albuquerque and has spent almost two decades in journalism. She co-founded New Mexico Compass. She was editor and writer for the Weekly Alibi, the Albuquerque Tribune, the Daily Lobo at the University of New Mexico. And she began her career in radio at KUN News in late 2013. She has been uh, the executive producer during the pandemic of your New Mexico government and now No More Normal. So it shows that are focused on the varied varied impacts of COVID-19, the community response, and racial and social justice. And we also have Jessica Onsores. She's managing editor of the Carlsbad Current Argus in Carlsbad, New Mexico. She was previously senior reporter at the Daily Newspaper, which serves Southeastern New Mexico. She has a master's degree in digital communications from American University in Washington and a bachelor's degree from Eastern New Mexico University in Portales. She's also a former Peace Corps volunteer. I wanted to talk with both of you because you're doing daily journalism um, and wanted to get your take on how maybe this role play resonated in terms of what you're trying to do every day to debunk false information for your readers and for your listeners to get actual facts. And Marisa, if you want to jump in, I know you just did a show on this <laughs> on KU. Yeah, so we did, um, we did a show uh, about misinformation and disinformation that's spreading in election season that's aimed at suppressing voter turnout. And so this can be all the way from people saying the elect that election day is the day after election day, right? So it can be really simple information that they're trying to spread, um, or it can be other stuff from what we heard from our guests around like your vote doesn't really matter. Um, and there's also a lot of discussion about on, on that episode um, about, it's called the disinformation age. If you wanna look up no more normal, the disinformation age. Um, we'll put a link to it on the resource list. Yeah, but people were really talking about how this spread of false information in an effort to suppress the vote is targeting uh, brown and black people and indigenous people in the United States, um, especially, right? Um, and so there are these efforts, these super cool efforts to uh, push back on that in a, in a really specific way. Um, so th that's really important. And then I would just say that the role play um, between Monica and Pamela was very familiar to me in terms of, you know, speaking to my own friends and family who are like, you have to cover this somebody's a clone or something, you know what I mean? And it's just like, no, you guys, let's talk, let's talk it through, right? Um, so yeah, I think it, it did resonate. I'm sure it resonates with a lot of people who are considering this conversation right now. Um, really cool resource from the Albuquerque Public Library. We had one of the librarians on our show and they made this guide like years ago about how to tell fake news and real news. Um, and I sent along a link to that as well, so it'll be on the resource page. But the librarian we spoke with, Ben, who was saying that most of the resources at the time when he made this guide felt very academic, felt very like collegiate. So he tried to make like a really easy to parse 
resource for telling um, real news and fake news, especially as you know, there's allegations of from the president and from other politicians saying that our real news is fake news when they don't like what's being reported, right? So being able to parse information and determine what reporters, what outlets you trust for information, knowing always to check and then also where to check, uh, that's all part of this this cool guide that um, the librarian made at the Albuquerque Public Library. It's an online resource. I love librarians. They just don't get enough shout outs right? for the services they provide, um, you know, yeah. yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah, I did put that in the resource list. And Jessica, you're in Southern New Mexico. Yes. And you are doing uh, the frontline work of community newspapers down there, which has been gutted nationwide. I'm just curious how you are managing to do this. You have reduced staff, furloughed mm -hmm. staff. Um, you cover this really important, huge swath of the state. So how are you tackling some of this? What did, did this resonate for you? And like, Most definitely. I'm just going to say like with Marissa, this conversation sounded very familiar. I have it with friends and family all the time. You know, I'll come over for coffee and they'll be like, did you see that they said da, 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 da. And my first question is always, who is they? Like, who are they? Do you know where you're getting your news from? Um, have you um, gone back and seen if they're a reliable source or, you know, is this just something that you heard from a daisy chain um, of gossip throughout the community. And I think that when we try to tackle um, this idea of misinformation or disinformation, we always do it in in-person conversations as well. The beauty of community news is that we're able to go out into those neighborhoods, um, talk to our um, our readers and talk to our subscribers and really have those one-on-one -on -one conversations about where are you getting your news from, right? Is it a reliable source? Why do you, why do you trust it? Um, why do you trust what they're saying rather than say one of our well-known television or newspapers. Um, so those are always interesting conversations. And I think that um, when <laughs> I laugh because um, there's always gonna be a distrust. I, I think that we're just at that point where they're never gonna fully um, take our word that you know we're a reliable source, we're unbiased. Um, the information that we're giving them has been checked you know, more than likely twice over versus wherever else they're getting their information from. Um, but we're seeing it a lot more as community reporters on the bigger issues that have effect on our communities. You know, we see it with elections now. We saw it with the census when the census was underway. There was a lot of misinformation um, happening about um, what questions were on there. Um, and the impact that that has is huge. Um, our, our number of responses just for the census, for example, um, were way down because people were apprehensive. They weren't certain what was going on. There was a lot of confusion. And as much as we tried to shed light on that, um, sometimes the message just doesn't get through or, or we're too late to um, try to you know, backpedal some of that information. But as community reporters, I think our, our best bet is just to try to identify when some of um, when some of our community is um, undergoing confusion or when there are topics that they need clarity on, um, we tackle those as they come along. And I think fr from my perspective as an editor, one of our primary jobs these days is to um, confront anytime there is fake news you know, circulating throughout the area or there is a topic that um, has been labeled fake news. And sad to say that sometimes that comes from our community leaders themselves, people that you would think were reliable sources. Um, sometimes that happens too. So you've just gotta be very vigilant um, about what's out there and be very smart about trying to, um, as I think Pamela said, you're not, you know, you're not addressing it in an aggressive way, but you're trying to have a civil conversation um, and put facts out there. I wanted, oh, wanna go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just want to piggyback a little bit off of what Jessica's saying, like um, the question of who's they, right? I mean, the thing about uh, journalistic ethics is that you should always see my name on top of stuff that I wrote, right? And that means that if you think I got it wrong, you can call me, email me. And if I did, I'm responsible for correcting it, right? And so our goal, of course, is to not have to make corrections. But I think an important thing in the real news, fake news conversation is that I'm a real person in this community trying to vet information for you, trying to figure out who's cool to talk to, reading through documents, 
waiting for meetings, you know, and fact checking things. And that doesn't mean I get it 100% perfect, but you know me and you can find me if I mess it up, right? And so I, I just feel like that's an important part of the, the relationship between media ethics and real journalism versus the fake news conversation. And so it is kind of important that you start to find voices in your community that you trust to be trying to do this work for you. And that's one of the advantages I would think that Jessica has is that, you know, working in her community, folks know her and she's built a relationship with that community, right? You should be able to find that in your in your community, regardless of whether you live in a bigger city or a smaller town or whatever, right? So it's harder and harder these days though, right? True. I want to just add to that and say that I think probably the most important part of, of what both Marissa and I are saying is this idea of trust, right? You have to have a level of trust from your readership, from your subscribers, even those outside of your sphere where you're covering. Um, but th what you are producing as news is news and it's been vetted and it's out there um, for their consumption. Um, and it's based on fact and not, you know, just rumor that we pulled out of thin air. You guys, I'm going to, I, I want to jump, actually, I was, you anticipated one of my questions because my experience with a lot of folks is there is this kind of idea of conspiracy theories, alternative facts is driven by a growing mistrust in media. But I hear people say the media, it's like this faceless amorphous blob that is evil. And my sense is I try to sort of dig down what people are talking about. It's sort of like they hate politicians, but they like their person in Congress. <laughs> and I'm just curious if you two have experienced this and you, Monica, when people are like, well, the media, I'm like, well, I don't mean you. I mean like the media. And I, I'm curious if there's a disconnect, like do they mistrust you or is it the media? <laughs> Can I, can I tackle that one yeah. first? Mm -hmm. it's, well, it's especially, it's especially um, a, a big issue for me because our newspapers are um, owned by Gannett and Gannett is the USA Today network. And so everybody sees it as this giant media um, conglomerate that has no connection to its, its local communities. But um, I find myself more and more trying to explain to people that a community newspaper is still a community newspaper. I live here, I work here, I travel the same roads you guys do, I eat at the same restaurants, um, I hear the same thing, you know, I have coffee with you every morning. Uh, so it's especially hard to tackle those, those types of mistrust or that idea of a cons big media conspiracy when you are corporately owned. Um, and we fight every day to just kind of make it clear that what we're covering isn't um, based on an agenda that's, you know, rolling down from a administrator up top, but it's really issues that we've identified that are important um, here in New Mexico, in New Mexico's southeast corner. And most recently, I'll just share briefly a story. Most recently, um, there was a very public um, accusation by a leader in our community uh, with that, that same tact, which was, you know, you're covering this um, in this light because you are being told to from, I don't know, some um, ghost of an administrator at the, the top of all of this. Um, and your advertiser. Yes, or your, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we are, you know, we're in every day um, having those conversations with people and trying to kind of remove this idea that we're puppets on a string and just covering items that um, we're being told to cover. So, you know, I think probably the, the, the biggest harm there is you're building that mistrust also. But you're also teaching um, consumers of media, whether it's television, radio, newspapers, um, that there is nothing that they're reading that they can rely on, um, even if it's at the local level. And combating that is extremely, extremely hard. Do you think, uh, Monica or Marisa, would it, would it help in terms of media literacy and trust if people understood how journalists work? I have this dream that that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, often I think like, um, I, maybe if I just like routinely every day gave a class online about like how journalism works or what journalists, uh, what journalism is, because I find myself, Marisa referred to this, you know, people call and they're like, you got to do this story. And it's like, well, we're a national talk show and you're, you know, your child custody case is 
is not news sorry you know and then it turns into this whole like well you're against me kind of thing and it's like I really sympathize with you but let me explain how this works I find that um show you know Native America Calling has been on the air 25 years and um it was really created as a response to the media <laughs> and uh, total yeah. absence of Native voices and faces in mainstream media which is still pretty much the case today and um and so a lot of our listeners are just are just grateful for um to have us you know although we get our own uh, our fair share of criticism as well <laughs> and i just so i i want to add that i think um you know, when you said people hate the media and it's just like a faceless blob, I don't know that I think it is just a faceless blob. I think sometimes they do have like one entity or one person in mind, right? Maybe hmm. it's CNN, maybe it's a, a journalist who said something racist on the air. Like it could be a whole bunch of different mm -hmm. reasons, but it's like one thing happens and when it's not handled correctly, when people don't apologize, is when there's not accountability, um, you know, it'll turn people off on the whole media, right? Um, so it's like really important that we're all vigilant um, to hold one another accountable, to hold ourselves accountable, but to hold each other accountable too. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not a painless process, but it's a, like the one of the most important things that as a journalist, I feel like we can be doing right now. Um, I also really like the idea about having the conversations directly, like, as journalists, we've been trained very much to keep ourselves out of the stories um, and to not to not narrate necessarily from our own perspective. But I feel like how, opening up the conversation about like how we do our work, what our ethics are, what principles we follow, what our goals and intentions are uh, with our coverage, I think really goes a long way in building trust. And I've found that in my own work, especially in the pandemic, right? Um, and then I would also just say that when we say that there's distrust of media, I feel like there's multiple kinds of distrust and reasons and they can't all be tackled in the same way. Like on some level, some people distrust media because they're just tired of hearing horrible, scary news. Like they're tired of getting a disorganized pile of bad news on the front page and so they just don't want it to be true anymore. And so they're looking for a reason to kind of write us off, right? Um, and then I think also it's because, you know, there sometimes uh, politicians are trying to persuade people that critical coverage is fake, right? That's something we've seen a lot. And people would rather believe their narrative, which might be more pleasant, right? Like COVID isn't real or something like this, right? Um, so that's one, another, that's a different side of it that has to get tackled. But additionally, I think um, news media has a long, problem, we, we did a show about this on KUNM about how the demographics of newsrooms are so white and so male that there's a distrust for that. It's like worse than any other industry in the US. The numbers are really surprising and, and bad, right? And so I think there is another kind of distrust that comes from people for decades and decades not having their stories um, told or told very well, not being considered expert sources, only being covered when they get in trouble. Like there's all these ways that that has played into this big distrust of media. So I don't think it, it all gets tackled with the same tool, the same hammer. Like I think those are all different, different levels and strata of how this problem um, plays out. And, and we have to try to fix them all different, you know? Jonathan, I haven't meant to, <laughs> I've left you out of the conversation. I'm sorry, that was not intentional, but um, I wanted to talk with you and I did not introduce you real quick. Jonathan Anzalone is uh, an expert in news literacy, writing and history. And he is the co-director or the, I'm sorry, the assistant director of the, um, I wrote down your wrong bio. I'm so sorry, Jonathan, I'll let you jump in. <laughs> <laughs> and introduce yourself. You're with the Center for News Literacy at Stony Brook University. Um, and I wanted to ask you uh, 
what that center does and how you're trying to tackle some of the issues we're talking about. Sure, thank you. Uh, the center began uh, back in 2007. And when we first got started, uh, I was a graduate student then in the history department. And when we first got started, our, our task was uh, try to teach as many Stony Brook students as possible news literacy. And uh, not just journalism majors and minors, but uh, as many as we could. Uh, now, we, we've taught since 2007 over 11,000 students. We were hoping for more, um, but uh, we, we've taught a number. But we've come to the realization that uh, we're, we're getting at these students too late. Uh, mm. not, not that the course isn't valuable at, at any age. And we've, uh, when I've worked with libraries, I've heard from a lot of seniors, uh, what can you do for us? So certainly anyone of any age can benefit. So uh, increasingly in recent years, we've been working with uh, middle schools and high schools to try to embed our curriculum into their, you know, they, they take a variety of approaches. Some work it into English, some into social studies, some have electives, but to try to universalize some form of news literacy education uh, as soon as possible, especially as students are getting their first smartphones and they're first encountering this, wider, very confusing world. And they may be uh, well equipped to use the technology, but I mean, uh, none of us, I don't know, are really well equipped to, to contend with the, the flood of information and sorting it all out. And especially a child who you know, is transitioning from, they've learned to read and now they're reading to learn. Um, and the, and so trying to get them up to speed on the, the different varieties of information and to kind of empower them as even if they're 11, 12, 13, they, can, they still have responsibilities as citizens, as news consumers, as contributors to our shared public health as we're, and that, that certainly that's hitting home right now. Um, uh, so we're trying to equip uh, uh, teachers at the middle school and high school level to, uh, empower their students to be uh, to be news literate because we think that it really has to be habitual. Uh, the kinds of questions that um, uh, it, your your other guests have been talking about and the challenges and the, and the, and the approaches to meeting those challenges really have to be habitual. Where automatically someone's saying, "Wait a second, that looks fishy." So how do we develop those good habits? Um, and we think we have to. Uh, start educating kids uh, as soon as possible. How do you help people develop those habits? So it's second nature. Well, uh, well we have a variety of approaches. Um, and I think just starting them, uh, starting them young means that they're uh, starting asking these questions as soon as possible. And then as they're you know, engaging with the world, becoming more curious, seeing the world beyond their, their homes and their communities. It's our, it's our hope that as they, in the classroom, they're internalizing these lessons, but then they see how they apply to their everyday life. And hopefully if they see, wow, I just learned something or I, 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 I corrected my grandparent and they, they, they thanked me for it, you know, getting that kind of positive reinforcement or I shared a story that I had checked myself and others appreciated that. You know, that kind of positive reinforcement of being a, a, a productive contributor to our information environment, we hope um, can kind of uh, create those good habits. What are some of the most common forms of false information right now? Um, <laughs> uh, There's so many. <laughs> it's, it's hard to pick. Um, uh, because you know, pick your platform, and your your it's it's a different poison. Uh, mm. um, now, uh, in terms of what, uh, of course, election season, and some of uh, uh, your other guests discussed that issue. Uh, we prepared a whole presentation about uh, COVID nineteen and all the misinformation surrounding that. Um, so those are our, our major concerns. Uh, for, for my students, for all, all, all the people we work with. And I, I have some personal experience with this as well, where my father forwarded me an email. He's not on social media. He's one of those email 
forwarding people. And it claimed to be uh, advice from Japanese doctors. And the advice was, and the way to fend off COVID-19 was to drink water every 15 minutes. And the, the rationale was that uh, it'll wash COVID-19 from your throat down to your stomach and your stomach acids will kill the virus and it won't get into your lungs. And you know, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, no. <laughs> um, and so uh, I, j just because, you know, as the opening uh, role play showed, we, you have to you know, approach this gently and, 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 and feel like, you know, you're, you're trying to, and which you are, you're trying to help uh, the person you're conversing with. And so I said, oh, oh, be careful with this. I've seen this in these contexts. I shared them um, with my father a couple of links to fact checking sites. Uh, look, somebody also claimed to be from Stanford University and they offered the same advice. Now, why are they claiming to be different people offering the same advice? You know, so there, there's something wrong here. So just be careful. Don't, don't feel as if you're, because you're drinking all the time, you're, you're protected from this virus. You'll just be in the bathroom all the time if, if you take that advice and you're not actually uh, protecting yourself. Uh, so it can come, it, there's so many varieties. But I, I find that the, the, the most effective uh, misleading information is it, it's, it's the simplest. Mm. It's a picture that's five years old, but it's being shared now. And therefore it, it's taken out of context and therefore has this great power to mislead. When there was a fire at Notre Dame Cathedral, uh, a story began circulating of a man who was arrested near the cathedral with bomb making materials in his car. The story was from five years before the fire. Uh, or, uh, and we're seeing this in the election of videos of the candidate speaking with just a short clip and then just share that short clip it looks like they're stumbling over their words. They don't know what they're talking about. And that, that can have an impact. Uh, so uh, so I, that's what I fear the most is that we're, we're not in the habit of reading, reading beyond the headline. We're not in the habit of just pausing for a second and saying, wait a second, who's this from? Who says Bill Gates is a clone? Um, it didn't come from YouTube. It didn't come from the internet. It didn't come from Facebook. Somebody posted it there. Those are platforms. And so uh, I think by showing our students and others how the questions we're asking are very simple and often in one or two steps, you can get at better information, you can get at the truth, you can debunk something very quickly. Uh, that, that I, it's my hope that that has a kind of empowering effect that look, they, they tried to pull one over on you and they failed, you, you got the better of them. Pamela, I wanted to ask you, what are some alarm bells that ring in your head if you're reading or seeing problematic content? Um, yeah. Jonathan um, touched on them, but. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe I could share my screen um, yeah. of, of some a project that I'm working on. And um, this is just really simple. It's a simple way to, um, Oh, it's a little big, but can yeah, everybody see that's that? Fine. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So these are just like a few different tips, right? So these are like just warning signs of, you know, does the headline and the content match? Sometimes they would be advertorials. In fact, I was just doing a workshop with some high school students and I sent them a, 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 an ad that was like President Trump. It was an ad, but it was written like a like a newspaper story. So it's sponsored content, right? And it said advertorial at the top, but students, this high school students didn't really know what an advertorial was. So the story was President Trump signed a bill um, on something and had nothing to do with the story, which was about, they were trying to sell a watch. And so it was like a health watch. And so it was an ad about selling this health watch, but it had nothing to do with like, the bill which had something to do with um, like health and hearing. And so it was completely disconnected. And so that was where the headlines and the content didn't match, right? It was also unbelievable. Um, there was a date, sometimes like a date is missing or old or a picture is, is you know, old. Like 
Jonathan was saying, um, different URLs, which um, just need to be checked. Like, is this really ABC News or is it like something that looks like ABC News? And there are some misleading content, right? Where it's a little bit like what I was just talking about that that sponsored content, right? Or um, it looks different. like an article, but it's it looks, an yeah, it looks like an article, but it's not, or it's an ad, you know, that's, I guess there's a little bit different between sponsored content and native advertising. And you all can just go and look up <laughs> through your search engines, the difference between those. Cause I don't want to take too much time here. Um, pseudoscience, which is pretend science, like these pretend scientists, just because somebody's a doctor doesn't mean they're an expert in that specific field, right? They could be a psychology doctor or a doctor of education or a doctor of, I don't know, whatever. And, but then they're speaking on COVID, like they have no authority, right, to speak on that matter. And then therefore there's, you know, kind of science. And so we, you know, we also need to strengthen our science literacy for people to be, to understand science better and understand the difference between, you know, science and pseudoscience. Um, sometimes information is taken out of context. Um, an, an example recently is um, where Dr. Fauci had, was in a political ad saying something and it actually, didn't they didn't have his permission from what I understand him say and he was saying something about speaking about health and not specific to whatever that his quote was taking out of context and put into a different context and it's like people curate right information they take different things and curate it into and create a narrative that is presented as a reality which is actually not reality so um, these are some things that we, you know, and also like sometimes there's false information with facts. And so when we see the facts, it seems like it's credible, but then it might not be. Um, and so the bottom line is always checking for like, who's the author, what source, what are all the sources within the story? Um, what is the evidence? Is it credible? Is it not? And that really gives you an idea by looking outside and doing a little bit of research as far as like what is reliable, what's credible. Obviously there's a lot more, like is there transparency? There's a lot more to look at, but this is like a good bottom line um, as far as like what, you know, things that could be alarming or what, you know, what, what to look for um, when we're looking at specific, you know, specific to news, right? Because news is a form of media. And so media literacy looks at all media um, and looks at it for, with a critical component, yet there's also the making, right? But there's critical in that you're asking questions. Critical is not like a bad thing. It's not even, it shouldn't be. It's really curiosity and inquiry, right? We're asking questions of what is presented at us, whether it's a meme or whether it's a YouTube video. And there's, you know, something in our brains that wants us to believe that what we're seeing is actually true. Seeing is believing, but seeing is not necessarily believing just because it was on the internet or somebody wrote it or somebody said that they're a Japanese doctor doesn't necessarily make it true, doesn't make it so. Um, but really from just while I have the platform, I'll just say like, it's important for, uh, for, for this kind of information we, and like Jonathan was saying, we have to work at different angles, right? We have to talk to the parents and we have to talk to the teachers and we have to get them to become and embody media literacy. And, you know, that then they could facilitate that. We have to work with the students and start at an early age and start with like some basic things and build up. And so it's working at, at different angles. I'm also the chair of um, media Literacy Now, the chair for New Mexico Media Literacy Now, the chapter chair for the state. And we're working on advocating for media literacy. So that's another angle as well, right? It's just like working at different angles to be able to get the information out that people need, because there is a lot of information. And, you know, how do you get people to you know, um, we, we just reach them differently from different angles. And I think that's the bottom line, you know, as far as like, how do I, we identify what's real and what's not. And, you know, there are a lot of angles depending on who your audience is and like 
how to reach that specific audience. Like what I would present to an adult would be different than I would present to a middle schooler, for instance. One thing I was thinking, Jonathan, that would apply to everyone who's engaged in any kind of social media, which is, you know, middle school, younger students, all the way up to adults and people our age, um, is now that we, we're all producers of content in a way, not just journalists like me and Monica and Marisa and Jessica, because we're on social media. So what kinds of tips do you give people and students about your responsibility in that role? I have been as guilty as anyone of seeing something like that's outrageous. I'm going to post this <laughs> Twitter and Facebook and then realizing if it's not outright false, it's not quite true or it's an evolving news story and further information down the road maybe tempers what we thought was an outrageous situation and maybe it's more nuanced. And so part of it is just putting, you know, don't hitting the send bar, you know, the send button right away. I, what are some tips you give to people in those situations? I think the, the kind of the most important message that we've uh, we repeat and we, re we repeat is uh, slow down. Now we can't slow down the pace at which news and information reach us. It's, it, it's so abundant, it's so, it's so fast. Um, but we can slow down our minds as we react to those. Uh, and so I show them some cautionary examples. Here's a, here's a terrible headline. Uh, from the New York Post, for example. And then look at it, the headline doesn't match the content. So if you had just reacted to looking at the headline and shared it, then you would have been misleading your, your social network. Um, so there are cautionary examples, but uh, we've tried because, you know, I, I, I realized that as a teacher, I, I may, I ran the risk of making my students cynics by showing them all of these negative examples. Look at this, that fooled somebody. Look at this uh, fake news. Look at this email my father sent me and, and so on. Uh, so frequently uh, I, I try to mix in good examples. You don't want this story about, um, uh, let's say about uh, corruption in your school district. You don't want that to get lost in the, in the flood of fake news. So. Uh, being news literate is more than, or media literate is more than just debunking the, the bad stuff. It's about finding the good stuff. And so mm -hmm. talk about the, the steps we need to take to find, uh, and we, we put it in these terms, we call it reliable and actionable information. Are you confident enough in the reliability of this news that you would act? And the act could be as simple as, yeah, I'm going to bring an umbrella, or it could be as profound as I'm going to cast my ballot for this candidate and, and everything in between. And of course, one of the biggest decisions we have to make now is, should I share this? So there are steps we have to take before we get to that click, that retweet, that pre pressing that button to pass on information to others. We, uh, we, uh, we try to teach students to em embrace their role as digital citizens and try to be positive contributors to this environment because we've, we're all victims of this confusion, and this bombardment of misinformation. Uh, do, do you want to further that or do you want to try to correct what we all agree is a problem? Are you I to oh, sorry. There's a bunch of Go ahead, Monica. Um, I was just going to say, um, for my, I used to take my cousin's kids to the movies and I would make them count product placement in the films. And um, one time they were like, can we just watch the movie? You have to. <laughs> and, you know, I realized I was doing what, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to exhaust people with it. I used to work for the Media Literacy Project and we once a week had a media literacy lunch and you know, a couple of times we talked with each other about like, well, let's start bringing some more positive things. And we started sharing instead of just like, look at this terrible commercial, look at this, look at that, because it becomes exhausting and you can become very cynical. Um, you know, if you're always on, always alert, 
looking for these things. What are you going to say, Marisa? Yeah, so from the show we did, The Disinformation Age, I got some really specific tips from Roberta Rael, who runs Generation Justice at KUNM. Um, on social media, uh, she recommends to avoid amplifying a piece of information you run across that is either misinformation or disinformation or just fake news. So you don't want to react even with like an angry react to a Facebook post um, that is a piece of disinformation, right? That's their recommendation. Um, also, she recommends that people report if they encounter disinformation and that they avoid cross pollination. So if you see something on Facebook that is disinformation, avoid reposting it on Twitter, right? Even if you're trying to point out that it's wrong. Um, um. And then she also recommends um, to prime your audience to distrust disinformation by naming the motivations and by sharing factual information from trusted sources instead. So that's kind of like piggybacking off of what everyone else is talking about. So those are the four tips and I can I can copy and paste those and send them over um, as, a, yep. as a help for this. Um, would you say, uh, sometimes you don't know, I mean, you can guess sometimes at the motivation um, of, of disinformation or something you're seeing, but we can't always know that, right? But it comes down to like trying to find something that counters that, that is factual, that's from a source that's been vetted. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, I mean, her, her um, recommendation is to, to identify the motivation, right? So I okay. hear what you're saying about how we don't always know the motivation, but sometimes it might be very clear. Like for instance, if it's a fall date for the election, right? The right. motivation is to get people to miss their opportunity to vote, right? Um, so I think when there is, when it is clear, she recommends that you spread that because you're inoculating your friends and your audience so that they can be on the lookout for the same kind of thing, right? One instance I've been thinking of that I think uh, Jonathan brought up. Um, so there was an interview Dr. Fauci gave in, I believe February or March where he was questioning the efficacy of masks and whether we should all have them. And this has been used widely in by people who are upset about the COVID restrictions. And what I've tried to share when people do that, it's like, look, this is an evolving situation and people and policymakers are adapting as we get more information. This is what he thought. He has since changed his stance. That happens. <laughs> people can change their, when they get more information, scientists can change their recommendations. So that's one that I was thinking of because to your point, Jonathan, that's something that's taken out of context a lot and shared, but part of it is also, I mean, it's our jobs as journalists and as media citizens, but it's also exhausting to try to counter false information all the time. Um, I'm wondering if you all get exhausted trying to do that, <laughs> if you have tips for people. <laughs> You can say something, Jessica. Well, I, I just want to jump in really quickly and say, yes, you're exactly right. It's is is exhausting, beyond exhausting. There's just so much out there. Um, but I think if you're real strategic about it, you know, um, one of the things that I've started doing is the first of every month in a column, I just take a topic about misinformation or disinformation or any of the, the fake news out there that has the biggest impact on the community we're covering. And I address it in a very straightforward way. And so people know that, um, you know, we are paying attention. We understand that all of that is out there, but also they've got a source to come to, to look at on a fairly regular basis where they can find some clarification or a little more information. Those news tips are those tips that Marissa and Pamela were talking about. Um, we include those as well. Um, so when you find strategies like that, um, that are dependable and reliable, it, it helps in some way to be able to um, address the issue. That's probably the best way that I've found to do to um, 
connect with my audience about this issue um, and also give them an avenue to ask questions. So I make sure that it's always included in email. Hey, you've got a question or if you've got a doubt about something you're reading or seeing, shoot me an email, send me a text, here's my number. Um, and again, just that, you know, face to face touch, um, I think works well. I think of it kind of like, um, like pulling the weeds in your garden, right? Like if you keep up with it and if we're all working on it together, you don't ever have that day where you step out in your yard and it's all overrun with weeds and you're like, oh man, what is, what is this day gonna be like, right? So it's kind of like if everybody's working on it collectively, we'll see less and less of it floating around. And if we can root out those sources and you know, hopefully figure out a way to flag them for one another, um, then, then it's like where you're doing that kind of daily weeding of your yard in the summer versus the once a month nightmare weeding, right? <laughs> I love that analogy. It's That's a great, a great analogy. analogy. And Can it's always also... good. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I do have some tips, you know, and, and it's those things that stick with people, right? Like, okay, what do you do if there's a fire? Stop, drop, and roll, right? Like, we all know, like, you stop, you drop, and roll. What do you do when you counter something that could be sketchy? Stop, check, decide, right? So we... Because there's, there's that point where, and this is the emotional check, we all have to continue to do, and that's another tip, the emotional check. Like, we get, if we get a gut reaction, like, oh, I just want to send this out. Like, I can't believe this is happening. And that's when people press that share button. But it's even, and that's part of that slow down that Jonathan was talking about, which is like, where am I emotionally with this? Is this like, am I sharing out of my gut and reaction instinct? That's when I need to slow down. That's when I need to check, you know, before I start spreading this like wildfire, right? So um, stop, check, decide. Uh, we had one question, go ahead, Jonathan. <laughs> We start our, uh, your, our semester with, uh, with a, an assignment where we ask students to try to go 24 hours without uh, consuming news, turn off, turn off their alerts, uh, don't go on social media. Um, we call so it not just news, like everything, just don't. Yeah, don't, don't check the weather. Um, uh, we call it the news blackout. And now maybe they're all lying to me, but I, I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that some of them make a good faith effort to, to complete the assignment. Um, and uh, of course, the, the, uh, the kinds of responses vary by students. Some find it to be a great relief to take a break from the news. Some find it stressful. I mean, I tried the exercise before giving to my students and I, I, I felt tremendous guilt. <laughs> like, what, what, I, I should know this, what am I missing? But the, the emotional re re reactions can vary. Uh, but many of them recognize, uh, and it's, it's a point when we discuss the assignment after they try it, it's a point I try to emphasize, but they often get there on their own, is that they're news consumers, whether they know it or not. They're consuming information, whether they're aware of it or not. It's just passive. And so it's, it's seeping in somehow, they're, they're learning new things, but not sure where it comes from. And so my message at the beginning of a semester is, okay, we, you just realized that you were consuming news. It's all around us. We can't really avoid it. So why not choose the active option instead of being a passive consumer? Let's be an active consumer. Yeah, take breaks from time to time for your mental health. I wish I could um, uh, take those breaks and, but, uh, the rewards of keeping up with the news and getting that reliable information. Uh, and as I said earlier, oftentimes when, uh, when we're working with whoever our audience is, they discover how easy it is to spot the junk. And, and, and so it, it, it doesn't necessarily take you know, 12 steps in a, uh, in, in a checklist. Sometimes it's just one step or sometimes it could be just well, that I'm not sure about that. I'll just I'll just let it be instead of passing it on to others. Um, so, uh, and plus, there are people who do this work for a living. Uh, you know, the uh, all of all of us here, the, uh, the the journalists as well. There are professional fact checkers. So rely on the people who have taken up that burden as a profession, and and let them help uh, let them be our guides as well. 
We had, uh, we're coming to the end of our program, but Bethany, I know you expressed um, interest in one topic and wanted to see if you wanted to ask that question since uh, it shows how, how vigilant we have to continue to be. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, something that has popped up recently um, in the last five years or so, um, or even three years, um, the, the deep fake technology and the way that people um, manipulate, the way that technologists can manipulate and puppet videos to uh, make it seem like people are speaking and saying words, you know, sampling their, their speech from other things that they've said and taking images of their, um, of other videos and puppeting these videos to make it seem like politicians or reporters, anybody, celebrities are saying things that they never actually said. And something that's striking to me about that is that there's, um, as you said, Megan, earlier, now we are all content producers because we're all on the internet, we're sharing things. And these technologists are, are these people who can do this, they, they sow disinformation um, and misinformation. And they, they specifically like place it um, by doing these things and they're not, they're outside of the journalism community and they're outside of news media. Um, and yet this, this misinformation can spread and people, that's how you get conspiracy theories to, to sort of start. So I just wanted to hear from you guys about, you know, what, um, I so appreciate all of these tips for how to evaluate media, but, um, you know, what are your insights into like tips on how to, how to be vigilant about new technologies that can be used to, to create misinformation? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I get, I'm going to throw it to my panelists because I don't know if I have any answers. It just shows how vigilant we have to be because technology's gotten to the point where you can fake photos, you can fake, you can make Nancy Pelosi look drunk in one of the famous deep fakes. Um, it could be just sophisticated editing or it could be clear distortion. Anyway. Do you want to want to jump in on that, Pamela? Um, the good news is that, you know, as these deep fakes are being created, people are working towards being able to detect them, right, with techno with the same technology, right? So these deep fakes are using AI, artificial intelligence, and it may be an actor, right, who looks a little bit like me, and then they speak, and then they, we, you know, they, like I could be a deep fake right now. How would you know? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, cool. So one of the things that you would know is, <laughs> is the blinking that Monica was talking about where people don't blink. There's like a few little things that we can do on our own, right? So there was a video that went out that was um, Facebook, the Facebook, you know, whose name... <laughs> Right now, it's the head of Facebook, Mark, oh, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. Yeah. yeah, where he's like speaking and, and it was a deep fake about him, right? So he like, he's not blinking. The sound is a little bit off, usually. Um, there, those are the two that I remember right now off the top of my head. But there, you know, those are two things that you start to see like something is just not right. You know, this video is slowed down because they're videos, they're pre-recorded videos. Maybe Jonathan has some more tips or ideas about deep fakes. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to chime in, but did uh, uh, Marisa, did you want to uh, uh, address that? I thought you, no, okay. Um, well, um, I'm sorry, I did have a thought about it, but um, I can wait till you're done and then I'll come back. Okay. Um, you know, some of the, the same tips and tools that we can use in, in other contexts are, are, are helpful. Um, so if you see, say, a deep fake of, uh, of a politician, but it's appearing on a YouTube channel that you don't recognize, that's, um, you know, uh, their, their channel is just a username, then, you know, that, that raises questions and we should at the very least re uh, reserve judgment. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I often uh, refer back to the, the three simple questions that the Stanford History Education Group recommends in their, when they talk about lateral reading. Uh, who's behind the information? Uh, and it's a, it's a simple question, but a step we often don't take when we say, I saw it on Facebook. We're not really interrogating the source of the information. What's the evidence? Now, 
he, he, that it, with deep fakes, it gets tricky there because the evidence has been manipulated. So it looks like it looks like may look like an authentic image or an authentic uh, video. With uh, with images, this doesn't work so well often with video. But at least with an image, we could try a reverse image search and see where else it has shown up to see if there's a fact check or if somebody claims that this 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 picture was taken yesterday, but it, it first showed up you know, 10 years ago, uh, like that, that shark that shows up after every hurricane, um, uh, that's something we can uncover. And then the third step I think will be very important uh, here as well is what are other sources saying? Uh, have other fact checkers weighed in? Has anyone raised doubts about this? And especially if somebody is a, a regular news consumer and they've identified a few outlets that they trust, then they can turn to those and see if they've weighed in on this video that uh, may be a source of confusion. I will also put in, there's a couple of good fact checking sources, uh, PolitiFact and Snopes, which started as this funny site to check urban legends and now has become this very, very important <laughs> fact checking site. Anyway, Marisa, what were you gonna say? Oh, just also that if it's a, a image from a public event or they're saying it's a recent public event, then you should theoretically be able to find other videos that show the same thing from other people. So I'm often, you know, if it's like, oh, look at this terrible thing that happened at this speech yesterday, I'm trying to find other uh, videos of that speech to confirm whether it's something that you can really see that it happened or not. So that, and that's not 100% foolproof, right? Because I think we have had a lot of really important firsthand videos emerge, of course, of like, police violence, you know, there's all these really important first-hand accounts that um, maybe would only have one source of video. But I would say like, if, especially if it's like a celebrity, a public event with a lot of people in the audience, probably you can find it another, another way to see um, what really happened. Monica or Jess, any last thoughts? I guess I just want to jump in and say that we were talking about media literacy, but equally as important is social media um, literacy, right? Really understanding the platform where some of these um, deep fakes are disseminated and, and spread. Um, that gives us you know, immense power to really understand where they're coming from, how they're shooting across the, those networks and really be able to jump in and you know, make a complaint or stop them. So it's, you know, for me, it's equally as important to understand you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, any of these social media platforms. I will say an acquaintance of mine did this thing where um, he just reposted something and I said, what are your sources on this? Like, oh, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just reposting. And I reported it to Facebook. <laughs> I don't know if he knows that, but I don't know if anything came of it. Anyway, Monica, I just wanted, do you have anything? Oh, oh sorry. Ahead. I just wanted to clarify. Um, so it, Media literacy has grown so much that the field of media literacy used to be about just the mass media and, you know, and now, well, in general, the definition for media literacy, media, right? So media is any form of communication through a medium that is not face to face, right? So the radio, the computer, the phone, anything in any platform. So that is media literacy and deconstructing and media literacy will deconstruct or analyze any form of media and social media included. Um, so I just wanted to make that clarification because I think, you know, this happens often where people have, you know, because we grew up with media literacy from the 90s, right? Or from the olden days of what it was and what it is now. And it's still media literacy is and takes into account all the different technologies and platforms of today. And Monica, I wanted to go yeah, to you, just, last thought. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, the foundation of media literacy is um, crit building critical thinking skills. And so um, it really has to start with that. And it's something that needs to be pushed for in schools. It needs to focus on um, beyond just learning how to answer questions on the test and things like that. Um, I would venture to say that we're at a critical thinking skills crisis in this country. And um, the work that all of us are doing is, um, is critically important um, for changing that. I can't think of a better thought to end on. 
So this has been great. I really appreciate you all taking time to share your expertise and your experience. And Bethany, thank you for giving us this opportunity. Yes, I think I feel like this conversation could go on for so much longer. And so I'm excited that this is going to be the start of a new mini series within starting conversations. Um, and thank you, Megan. Thank you to all of all of you guys who uh, came on. And you're so generous sharing all of these tips and all of your thoughts and insights um, uh, and on behalf of the council. So thank you. Um, and just to let everybody know, um, linked in the YouTube caption will be um, a resource list with some links provided by all of our speakers today. And uh, you can click on that and these uh, sort of, um, all of these tips will be shared on this YouTube channel. So uh, thank you so much, everyone. And this is Starting Conversations. Bye. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.